Well, because this sermon is being recorded for tomorrow morning at the Worship Cafe, I feel like I should give a disclaimer. You've already heard this, but for those that will be watching uh, in the cafe, the decorations behind me are not an exact replica of anything in the first century. They're not stage props for the book of Acts. They are for our musical, in case you're wondering. I thought about saying, this is exactly what Antioch looked like, but it's not true. They're for the musical following in the next hour. We're in a year-long study of the book of Acts. If you're new and you haven't been here, then uh, welcome. But we've been studying the book of Acts. Acts is the story of how the church began. And we've been saying all along since September, it's our story as well. We are a part of this. We are a product of this, if you will, what the Holy Spirit did in Acts and is doing still in the world today. And we've been looking at this in different series as this, the church and the story unfolds, and it's a very exciting story. And now we come to a very, a, sort of an obscure text, one that sometimes you're tempted to skip over, but many of you have already read. And well, before we get into the text specifically, I just want to begin by sharing an experience I had with somebody years ago. Many years ago, when a good friend of mine was on staff, he's since moved away, but we had a ministry to some Muslim refugees. And through this friend of mine, Pastor Kevin Engel, some of you might know him, we, I got to meet a young man from the country of Kazakhstan. He grew up in a Muslim family, and uh, he had come over to our country and uh, was as a young boy, and so was sort of in that strange position of being raised in a Muslim home, born in a different country, but being westernized from the earliest days in his life, and feeling the pull between the roots and traditions of his family and his faith, and going to public schools in America, and feeling this, this strange dichotomy going on. And we met and talked, as he was a young man at this time, talked about our beliefs, and uh, what we believed, and talked about some of the hang-ups we have with each other's beliefs, very honestly and openly. He said one of the biggest hurdles for him, since he'd been over a decade now in, in America, was that to him, Christianity was not a unified faith. I mean, there's not one Christianity, he said. There's so many different stripes and denominations. You don't even all read the same Bible. His objection was, which one am I supposed to believe? You're not even together on what it is you believe. And I admitted to him that was partially true, but I also gently reminded him that Islam is not exactly a unified faith either. And he admitted that. We had a, good, a very good-natured and I think in civil discussion even debate. And then we started talking about reasons for division, why these divisions take place. Now, we have to admit as Christians that we have had more than our share of sinful and shameful divisions in our history, historically speaking. If you look back at Christian history, we have parted ways as brothers and sisters in Christ for some ridiculous things. And you've heard about some of those even in our series. But does this mean that every division is wrong or that division itself is always wrong? Are there any things that are worth dividing over if it should come to that? Acts 15 actually addresses this issue and this question in a sense. Does it mean that every issue is trivial and unity, being unified, means that we should never argue or debate or discuss for fear of division? That's the, that's the question sort of that we're going to answer as we look at Acts chapter 15. Let's look, if you have your Bibles, we're on the screens, Acts 15, and I'll read to you from the first, just the first 12 verses. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in great detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers." When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared that all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul, and as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Again, this is a pretty remarkable passage. And 
it's a strange passage. I mean, we've been hearing about this thing called circumcision a lot. And I think if you're reading this and you're not sort of steeped in Jewish tradition history, it's like, why do they keep, this is gross. Why do they keep talking about this? Why does this keep coming up? Let's move on, pick a different subject, Paul. Let's get off this, this whole thing. Uh, however, I think this chapter shows, and it's, it's tempting to skip over it because it's a, what, what we have in Acts 15, I only read the first 12 verses, it goes on for, that's about a third of the chapter, it goes on. What you end up with in, in Acts 15 is a very long, a very detailed, technical, theological debate. Now, I know there's a few of you, one or two like me, who get excited about that. But the average person who hears long, technical, theological debate thinks, boring. Like, I don't want to hear that. That's not exciting to me. Anybody ever watch a two-hour debate on YouTube over, like, the, some issue of, of theology? I have. It's fun, right? What, what a great evening that would be, right? No, most of us are like, let's move on. I don't even care. And it's tempting. But if we're not careful, we miss, I think, what are very important aspects of the gospel that, that come out of this passage. I want to outline for you four critical aspects of the gospel that come out of this debate. And I'm going to give them to you right in a row. Right, one after the other, then we'll talk about them. And I want to let you know right off the bat that the, the labels for these, the, the framework for this sermon, I got from a, a man named Pastor Timothy Keller out of Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City, just so you know where it comes from, because I'm borrowing his language for these four, but I think he's dead on, and he's not alone there either. First, uh, this passage tells us about gospel accuracy, getting the gospel right. Two, second, gospel liberty, what the gospel does in us. Three, gospel community how it brings us together, and fourth, gospel purity. Accuracy, liberty, community, purity, all four components of what we call the gospel, and unpack them in Acts 15. Notice the first thing that happens here in the text. We're told that some men came, so what, what, just to set the stage for you, in case you've forgotten or haven't been with us, Paul and Barnabas have been in Antioch. Now, Paul is formerly Saul of Tarsus, a radical uh, Jew of the Pharisaic party who was opposed to Christianity, gets converted in Acts 9, gives his heart to Jesus, becomes the greatest champion of the gospel, the greatest enemy to the greatest champion, one of the best pictures of what the gospel does right there. He is... Um, Doing all kinds, he's just come back actually from his first missionary journey. Uh, Jerusalem was the center of the early church movement, but it is now sort of transported to Antioch. Antioch is now the new uh, ground zero, if you will, for the missionary movement, the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. Paul and Barnabas have just come back from a two and a half year missionary journey, and they're in Antioch. They're teaching and they're encouraging all the believers in the church in Antioch. And some brothers, that means other Christians, other Jesus followers, show up in Antioch and they say, teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then in verse 2, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate. That's a polite way of saying they got after it with each other. They did not agree. There was a serious clash, no small dissension or debate here. So you get what's going on. The church is exploding. The gospel is spreading. Paul and Barnabas are in the new center of activity, Antioch. Some men show up who claim to follow Jesus, and they're preaching something different that gets Paul upset. And there's a debate that breaks out about this. It would have been easy, I think. Now, the result of this is that Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem. That's some 65 miles south. It would have been easy. If I, I was thinking about this, for me, I mean, Paul is doing great things. He's spreading the gospel all over the Roman Empire, sailing across the Mediterranean, preaching the word of God. People are coming to Christ in droves. He's preparing for his second trip. It would be easy for him, and for me if I was him, I'd uh, be glad that I wasn't, by the way, but, but if, it, if it was me to say, look, I don't have time to go to Jerusalem and get embroiled in some technical debate over theology. I'm doing big things here. God's at work. Send somebody else. You guys fight about it. I'm busy saving people. God's using me here. Why would I go there and fight about some details? But Paul does go. That ought to give us pause enough to say this was an important issue. The, the clarity, the accuracy of the gospel is at stake. Otherwise, why would he go? Unless he just liked to fight. I think he goes because it's that important. Getting this part right What's at stake is so crucial that it could undo the whole movement if they don't understand it. And that's why he goes to Jerusalem. Gospel accuracy matters. It's hard for us to grasp, I think, in our pluralistic and individualistic society. Most people today are not that concerned with truth claims. I talk to many people, perhaps you've heard this objection or something like it. Look, I don't 
care if it's true so much. I want to know if it works, if it helps me, if it does something in my life. That's what matters to me. Interestingly, C.S. Lewis wrote about this in his essay, Man or Rabbit, which you can find in a book called God in the Dock or Selected uh, Literary Essays. He says, some people will say, all I'm interested in is leading a good life. So I'm not going to choose my beliefs because I think they're true, but because I find them helpful. Do you understand that? And this is written in 1943, by the way. How relevant is this? Some people, many today, will say, look, what I'm con concerned with is, is this helpful to help me live a good and happy and secure and comfortable life? So I'm not interested in theology or truth claims or doctrines. I want to know, does it help me? Does it work? In other words, that's very typical today. Lewis's response, if Christianity is true, then it's quite impossible that those who know this truth and those who do not should be equally well equipped to live a good life. Knowledge of the truth must make a difference in one's life and actions. Did you hear that? Knowledge of the truth must make a difference in how we live. What you believe really matters. Lewis elsewhere says, if Christianity is false, it's of no importance at all. If it's true, it's of infinite importance. What it can never be is moderately important. In other words, if this is true, it, gospel accuracy, if it's right and true what the Bible claims, then it's of infinite importance. If false, forget about it. It doesn't matter. It's of no importance. But it's not mildly or moderately important. Now, the center of Christian belief then, in the first century and now, is the gospel, the message of salvation in Christ. So getting the gospel right matters, not just for eternity, but for this life. That's precisely what Acts 15 is all about. So gospel accuracy, then gospel liberty, or gospel freedom, if you will. What's really the issue here? Let's dig, dig into some of the details of the issue, the debate here. Look at verse 1 of Acts 15, if you have your Bible or your Acts journal. Verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Look at verse 11. Skip with me down to verse 11. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Those two verses highlight what's at stake. Salvation. How do you get into God's family? How are our sins forgiven? Is it Jesus plus the tradition of Moses? Or is it Jesus plus nothing. Which is it? It's one or the other. That's why Paul says we've got to go. We've got to get this settled. This matters. Because they're saying you cannot be saved unless you have faith in Christ plus a bunch of other stuff. And Peter's saying, and Paul are saying, no. We'll be saved by his grace through faith, period. Done. End of story. That's what's at issue here. Now, when a first century Jew, when you hear this phrase, circumcision... And the, and the law of Moses, it was a euphemism for all of the Levitical law, the, the, the sacrificial code, if you will. Circumcision was the sign given to the males of the covenant. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but it encompassed all of it. And if you read through Leviticus, and we'll do that someday, and it'll be very exciting for you, keep you up at night, you'll be riveted. When you read through the clean laws, what makes a man, if you, if you touch something dead, if you do this with the blood, you can't do that with the blood. If you touch a dead animal or dead body, here's how you make yourself clean again. You can go in the temple here, but not here. Here's how you offer these sacrifices. Very technical, very detailed, very tedious. And that's what they're saying you had to obey. So in other words, it's the circumcision and the law of Moses, one package deal to be saved. So believe in Jesus, yes, he's the fulfillment, but you still got to keep the law. That's what they're saying. Now let me ask you a question. Who are the earliest Christians? The, the gospel first comes where? What city? Anybody? Jerusalem. Remember Pentecost, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2? Jerusalem, the center of Judaism. Who are the first people to trust and follow Jesus? Jews. This is why this matters. And Jews that, had, that were faithful to Judaism and the Old Testament law and trust Jesus, well, they kept the law out of cultural tradition and of desire to please God, fine. But what happens is now Paul and Barnabas and others are preaching to non-Jews, pagan Romans, polytheistic Greeks, and they're coming to trust Jesus. And they're not adopting the, the Old Testament Levitical law. 
primarily because Paul and Barnabas didn't require it, didn't tell them they had to. And some people are saying, hold on, time out, Paul. That's not the whole gospel. You left some stuff out. Paul's saying, no, I didn't. And that's what it's at issue here. Look at verse 5 of your text. Kind of highlights it a bit. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, by the way, that was Paul's party when he was a Jew, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and order them to keep the law of Moses, meaning the whole thing. That's what's at stake. And one of the reasons for this was that, um, this is the serious debate, is that there's two key verses in the chapter that help us see the gospel liberty here. Look at verse 10. We did read this verse. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither us nor our fathers have been able to bear? That's a fascinating verse. That's Peter speaking here. He says to them, look, you know what the, the yoke refers to. By the way, in, in, in the ancient world, in Judaism, uh, if you were to follow a rabbi, Jesus is called the rabbi by his disciples, and they followed him. If you were following a rabbi, not Jesus, but any rabbi, you would, take, you would adopt their way of life their interpretation of the Old Testament, their uh, code about how to live it, and their teaching. And that, that was called a yoke. You took their yoke, meaning you were yoked like your oxen together with your rabbi to live their kind of life, to follow them. And so Peter's saying, why are you putting this yoke on the necks of these Christians, which neither you nor our fathers were able to bear? What's he saying? Look at our history, he says. Look at our own history. We couldn't keep this law. We continually break this law. Why are you putting it back on them? It will only crush them. Now look at verse 28. We didn't read this verse, but it's later in the chapter. If you have your Bible, verse 28. This is the, so what happens then is they decide to write a letter to the Gentile Christians in Antioch to be spread throughout the, the, the churches. This is part of the letter. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. We'll get to the requirements in a minute. The whole point of the gospel is that it takes away burdens. It liberates us. It doesn't load more stuff on us. It takes it off of us because we can't bear it. We can't keep the law. The point of the law is to point that out. You're a lawbreaker. You can't be holy enough. So don't load more requirements on, but lift them off and place them on the one who died for you. That's the whole message of the gospel. It removes our burdens. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 and 30, if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. I'll read it for us if you don't. I don't hear pages turning. That means you didn't bring your Bible or you just figure he'll turn there and I'll, he'll read it. Verses 29 through 30. Jesus speaking here. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's essentially what Peter and Paul are saying here. Look, Jesus liberates us from the burden to be religious enough to be good enough, to be righteous enough, to be spiritual enough, to do enough to balance the scales in our, in, our, in our favor. We can never do it. Our own history shows us that, he says. The gospel takes that burden off. And don't think this is just an ancient Jewish issue. We have our own burdens, don't we, in this culture. We also struggle with it's Jesus plus some stuff. Yes, believe in Jesus, but you better get to church. Yes, believe in Jesus, but you better make sure you're, you, know, you put a little something in the plate or you serve once a month or you read your Bible or you're, you know, whatever it is. Right? We load all kinds of stuff on there. Now, I'm not saying, <laughs> as a pastor, I'm not saying, don't go to church, don't give, don't serve, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it doesn't save you. It doesn't save you. He saves you at the cross. He lifts your bur the burdens off of you, takes them on him. That's why the cross is even necessary. When you read through Leviticus, all these rivers of blood and bulls and goats and lambs being sacrificed and all the requirements of making sure it's perfect, what's it all pointing to? The one who removes all your burdens and pays for them. He sets you free, gospel liberty. To do what? To live for him. So all the stuff we do then is out of love for him. I've heard lots of people say, as a side note, by the way, you Christians, you don't even obey the whole Bible, Right? Have you ever heard this or wondered this? Why is there some stuff in here we no longer do? And why do we do others? 
You ever wondered that? I have. I've had it asked of me. Why is there stuff in the Old Testament that we don't even, we sort of ignore? Well, we don't have time to get into it too much because there's a musical. We could stay till I 10 if you'd like to discuss all these things. But I guess most of you are like, mm, no, I have things to. Anyway, so there's two. If you could divide the law into two halves, in a sense. There's the moral law. Think 10 commandments. How to live in a God-honoring way. And then there's the Levitical law. The clean laws, if you will. These laws are all pointing to something. These laws are what God, how he wants us to live for our sake. To please him, but for our good sake as well. These laws are all pointing to our need, and they're all pointing to Christ. And so in Christ, they're fulfilled. The point, remember the, remember the debate here is, how are we going to have fellowship as Christians, Christ followers, with those Gentiles if they're not keeping the laws? Because these laws, these clean laws, are what make you clean. And if they're not clean, how can we eat with them, right? That's the criticism of Jesus. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? That was a criticism of Peter four chapters earlier. You sat down and you ate with these Gentiles, right? They're unclean. But what the message of the gospel in Acts 15 is, no, 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 no. There's a new way to get clean. All that stuff is pointing to the only one who could make you clean. Why do you think those bulls and goats and rams are sacrificed every year over and over and over again? He paid for it once for all. Remember, remember in John 13, with the Last Supper, when Jesus is having, he washes his disciples' feet. Do you remember this scene? Maybe vaguely, some of you. Maybe it's all Hollywooded up in your head. You've seen movies. We go back and read in John 13. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And he comes to Peter. And Peter refuses, right? He says, no, no, no. I should wash your feet. And Peter, Jesus says, Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter says, well, give me a bath then. He doesn't actually say that, but he basically says, well, then bring it on. Wash me. And Jesus says something very interesting. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. What does he mean? What's the word? Grace. You're already clean because of what I am saying, who I am, and what I've come to do. We, as his followers today, are made clean, that is, right before God, in only one way. Not through our effort. Not through a whole bunch of stuff, a yoke we have to bear, things we have to do. But by trusting in his death on the cross. That's what's at stake in Acts 15. And quite frankly, I think it's at stake still in the church today. So we are bound to obey the moral law. That's how we display the character of God. But the sacrificial and Levitical clean laws were all pointing to Jesus and he fulfilled them all. So to go back and try to obey the Levitical law would be essentially, in a sense, to say what Jesus did was not enough. But it is enough. So let's be clear. As Christians, we are under the authority of the Bible. We are not free to pick and choose what we will or won't, will not obey. We are not free to say that any part of the word of God is not applied to us or we no longer have to obey it or keep it unless the authoritative word itself says that that's no longer binding on us, which it does, Part of, partly here in Acts 15. But now the one to whom the whole Levitical law pointed has come. So we see gospel accuracy. We've got to get this right. What is the gospel? And then gospel liberty. What does it do? It frees us from this need to ever be good enough. You know, I think sometimes it frees us from in our culture, and I struggle with this too, perhaps more than some of you. The, the, the burden to have our children be good enough. Don't you think that raising kids in Chicago suburbs is the ultimate competitive sport? Don't you see, and I struggle with this, and I confess this often, that we, we get real wrapped up in the success of our kids, and so much of me or us is tied up in that. It's a burden. The gospel says, you're placing a burden on your kids when you do that, Jeff, that they can't bear, and neither can you. The gospel takes that off. At least it's supposed to. It liberates them, liberates you. Whatever that stuff is. So we see gospel community next. We, we don't have time. This happened last week too. I don't know what happens here. There's like a time warp in the middle of the sermon. It always comes to this. We have two points left. Gospel community. Notice that this whole issue takes place in the context of community. They came uh, in together to discuss this together. Verse 28 says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. What's that mean? It means they're reading the word together. They're praying together. They're discussing together. It's not two experts go off somewhere in an ivory tower and decide and come back and say, here's what you have to do. Together they're discerning. What do you want with us, God? What is the message, God? The whole thing happens in community. 
There's something else in this letter that, that, that they sent the Gentile believers, that, which I think we, we have time to cover here. Look at, open your Bible, look at verse 29, 28 and 29. This is the letter that they send. And they say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood. Wait, what? Didn't we just say you don't have to keep the law anymore? Doesn't it sound like it's a reversal of what we just said? Like they're saying, okay, this part of the law. Most scholars believe, and I agree, that what's going on here is not you have to do this to be saved. You, you Gentiles technically are free from obeying the Levitical law in the Old Testament. You don't have to obey that to be clean. Christ makes you clean. But you're living in community with a whole bunch of Jews who struggle with this issue. Would you consider laying aside your gospel freedom for the sake of relationship so you don't offend your brothers and sisters who struggle with this? Would you abstain from eating food sacrificed to idols for their sake, not for your own? Does that make sense? Gospel community. In other words, we're not talking about salvation here. They're saying, look, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But these Jews that you love and live and, and, and minister with and worship with in your church, they struggle with this issue. So maybe you could do the, the community a favor by following this law, not for your salvation of your soul, but for the sake of community. So we give up some rights sometimes for the good of another. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, I abstain from these foods. Why? Not because I have to, but for the sake of my brothers and sisters, in order to avoid offending someone else. Finally, gospel purity. We see gospel accuracy, got to get that right. Now, I, I will often come to... Um, when I'm talking to somebody, I'll ask the question, if they're, if they're struggling, if I, if I have a sense they don't really know who Jesus is, I'll say, are you a Christian? And if they say anything like, well, I'm trying, well, I hope to be, well, I'm working at it, then I know they fundamentally misunderstand. There's a gospel accuracy issue, right, in their heart. Because that's a yes or no question, friends. Are you a Christ follower? Right now, you should be able to say, yes, I am. Now, once, or no, I'm not. Now, you might say, I, I, I am, but I'm not doing so well in this area, or I have doubts, or I struggle, or I'm, I'm tempted in this sin. Fine, we all struggle. But if I ask you, do you follow Jesus? Have you turned over your life to him? Have you trusted in his forgiveness for the payment of your sins? And, do you, and are you living your life as best you can for him? That's a yes or no question, Christian or not. By grace through faith. Gospel accuracy, gospel liberty, gospel community, finally gospel purity. Christians in particular, I think the church in general, have always struggled historically with this issue. We seem to slip from the central message of our faith. We have a history of adding stuff to the message, burdens, if you will. Look through our history. Read about the Jesuit movement and, and the great mission and hospitals and orphanages and mission organizations in Central Africa, in Northern Africa, in Southeast Asia, in, in South America. Wonderful movements. However, there's, there's often the gospel is sort of convoluted or hidden with a whole lot of Western stuff. We, we mix it up. Read David Platt's book, Radical, by the way. He says one of the ways the gospel gets convoluted or polluted in our culture is with the American dream. The American dream... Big house, three-car garage, three-and-a-half children. I don't know where the half comes from. Dog, you know, vacation home, money in the bank. The American dream is not the gospel. I'm not saying God's mad if you have that. That's not what he died to give you. That's not what the church is about. We have a tendency in our every culture to sort of bring in other stuff and miss the message, the essence of it. Jesus plus anything else is not the gospel. So we must continually return, re-clarify, re-purify, refocus our attention on the central message of who we are and what we're meant to do in this life. I met with a man just a couple weeks ago, a young guy who's new to Christianity, came to Christ recently and is reading through the Bible and we're meeting together and I, I, we're, I'm hammering away at this issue with him. You know, he's the one who said to me, I might have shared this, I, forget, I forgot where I shared this now, but he's the one, when I shared the, the, God, the message of salvation is grace. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. He says, that's great news. What do I have to do to get this gift? I said, oh, wait, wait, no, no, you're missing it, right? There's something missing. You don't do anything. How do I get it? Like you get any gift. You put out your hand. You receive it. But I've been, we come back to this. We met probably a half dozen times. We come back to this over and over again. 
hammering away. Why? Because it's so foundational. He's got to get this right if he's going to experience the liberty and the joy and the freedom that Christ brings. You smuggle anything else in there, it's going to burden his soul. Not good enough. I ought to be better than I am. Gospel purity. This is the uniqueness of the gospel. And it's radically counterintuitive to the sinful human heart, to our condition. You see, at its core, the gospel message is not advice. Here's what I mean. Most major world religions or faith systems are advice. Rules and advice. You ought to do this if you want to experience nirvana or enlightenment or peace or harmony or love or joy. Do these things. Here's some good advice about how to live so you can experience whatever you want to call it. That's essentially what the world has to offer you in lots of different forms. The gospel is utterly unique in that it is not good advice. It's good news. It's not good advice about what you must do. It's good news about what God has done for you. And there's all the difference between those things in the universe. That's what's at stake in Acts 15. And frankly, it's what's at stake in the church today. We have to get the gospel right. I pray that we do.